G'day all you wonderful people, thank you for your patience this week, football come down, coming at you a day late, um, as I did put up a post on the last video I did. I, um, I just hit this point of mental and physical exhaustion yesterday, that I'm sure is completely unrelated to West Coast, um, where I thought, oh, I, I could do the football come down now and just hate every second of it, or I could get a good night's rest. I spent most of the day in bed yesterday and uh, do it today. So thank you for your patience. We had about 73 comments and uh, I'm keen to, to get into it. Feeling so much better than I did 24 hours ago. So again, thank you for your patience. Let's crack into it. We've got a few general comments to start. We got B Steve saying, most open and unpredictable season ever. Down is up, right is left. Tipping is for mugs. That's a great merch idea. And people who use tipping tactics like, hmm, uh, well, I like the color of their logo, so I'll tip them. I have to agree with you. It's kind of like a cliche that people say this about tipping, but this year, more so than many I can remember, probably recency bias, yeah, t tipping has gone out the window, particularly as the seasons wore on. So I think I worked out, if I had tipped the opposite team in all the last three weeks, I'd either have the same or one less tip correct than I did tipping actually who I thought was going to win. And the funny thing is, I think my ranking has only improved or like dropped by one out of like 1400 people, whatever it is in the tipping competition. It just goes to show nobody's doing that well in tipping as it currently stands. Kip the Mapper says, Giants, Port and Hawks look like favorites to win the Premiership. Yeah, I mean, it really, it's gonna come down to like finals placings and who gets double chances. And we know even that is not a perfect indicator because teams have won outside the four before. And I do feel like this year is shaping up to be one of those seasons where, you know, fourth could play seventh in the grand final. I, not being completely literal when I say that. I still think Sydney though, if they secure top spot, which I think they basically have now, if they win their last game, or even if they lose it, I think there's still a good chance to finish top. Um, I think you have to throw them into this mix. Pre-finals by, there's such a variable here where teams can rest up and come out looking different in the first week of the finals. Leo says, your all Sydney grand final predictions looking very, very good. I know, I made this prediction. I said at the start of the year, GWS to beat Sydney in a grand final at the start of this season. And then I doubled down on that in the mid-season ladder prediction, which probably seemed crazy because I don't think GWS was going super hot at that current point in time. It's shaping up where it could be the top two teams or at least first and fourth or something, depending on how the final round goes. So I'm kind of hoping I get my prediction right. That would be sick. All right, let's get into the, the weekend of action. Essendon uh, was undone by Sydney after a good first half. Uh, and I think, yeah, I think a quarter, half time they were leading by seven. And generally speaking, you know, we're sort of suffocating Sydney to some extent. Sydney couldn't get their ball movement going. That kind of shifted in the second half. Sydney were able to kick away and win on the back of, you know, Errol Gordon had a really good game. I know Chad Warner didn't play. But again, I think it's kind of a case of Sydney blowing off some cobwebs. It's a frustrating game again for Essendon. It feels like they're doing a lot right and, you know, falling away. And it was 36 inside 50s to 18 at half time. And Essendon routinely unable to put scores on the board despite having access to their forward 50. And I, maybe that's an ingredient for if that clicks, if that forward half conversion clicks in the future, they might improve, but I can understand why they're a bit bitter. So we'll get straight to the comments because this, this is a big one to start. 12 Hoops says, as an Essendon fan, Ben Mackay is the worst key back in the league because everything he does well with his intercepts, he gives up with his ball use and gives up three goals a week because of it. A forwards are average and just clutter the forward line. They do not move and are lazy bums. And without Ridley's ball use, we struggle to play it up the field because of the lack of good ball users. The prospect of Dan Houston getting traded to Essendon makes me excited. Brad Scott's selection isn't bold and plays it safe. We've played the least amount of debutants in the league and bringing in Wiedemann and Perkins shows something when you have Hayes and Saad L. Hawks deserving of a game in the VFL. I think that's an autocorrect. Is it El Hawaii or something like that? Forgive me if I'm getting that wrong. Anyway, bit to unpack here from an Essendon fan who's frustrated. I did see that Ben Mackay has like the worst one-on-one -on -one um, percentage of contest one or something like that of any key back in the league. So that's a bad start. I have felt like with Essendon, sometimes it's the ball use inside 50 that's a little bit slow. Um, that makes it hard for a forward line that is not star studded. Now, I do think there's some talent there and I reckon it's a forward line that can get by with, you know, when Peter Wright's in form, I think he's a very good forward. There's Kyle Langford and there's Stringer again, a little bit uh, up and down with what he can produce. But I actually don't know if it's the talent there. I think if they are able to use the ball inside 50 a little bit faster and make them a little bit less predictable, then I think that would go a long way. And as for selection, I have noticed this. Like I'm hearing things about Ben Hobbs potentially being a trade target for other clubs because he's not getting a game. Elijah Sardis had 41 in the VFL. 
I've also heard Essendon fans sort of complaining about the conservative selection and obviously uh, more criticism this week, Darson Heppel not getting a game. So that's an interesting one to me. I did think the Wiedemann in thing was a bit odd. Um, and I think it would be a blow for Essendon. You know, I think Hobbs and Sardis are, are two pretty talented first round picks that could be playing in that midfield. So maybe they could have played those guys a little bit more. Um, I'll leave it to the fans to really decide on that. But I have noticed that. Papley lives rent free in your head, says, after learning how to play one full quarter again last week, Sydney have now learned to play two full quarters thanks to Essendon. That's right. I still think Sydney is still blowing off cobwebs. Um, absolutely. It's been far from a four quarter performance. But again, like I said, freshen up pre-finals by. They get two home finals. I still think we have to consider them a major contender, even if they're not playing like one at the moment. So let's move to the Gold Coast Melbourne game. Again, not so much to say about this game purely because it was a dead rubber. I will say I was surprised that Melbourne won this game in general, but also clobbered them. And I'd probably lured into the trap of thinking Melbourne were a little bit cooked, you know, sort of low on confidence, a lot of discontent at the club. And they certainly didn't play like a team uh, with that issue at the moment. Some really promising signs for them. Um, you know, Jack Viney was outstanding in this game. Mid-forward connection looked pretty good in this game. I don't think Gold Coast was particularly good, you know, particularly after half time. but to a tall forwards, like Daniel Turner kicked four goals, Petty kicked three, Van Royen kicked three. This has been a problem for the for the Demons in the past. So the fact that they can do this with, you know, no Oliver, no Petrarca, Viney standing up and lifting, I, I think, um, you know, this given me a little bit to think about here with Melbourne, and Melbourne v Collingwood next week will be very interesting game. Kind of a dead rubber, but still kind of interesting. 12 Hoop says, Gold Coast are frauds and don't have half their premiership list. Ooh, oh, tough, tough. My, my read on Gold Coast is that still a lot of their best players who are going to drive that improvement are still not in their prime. When you consider as well, a lot of the guys, you know, they've drafted who are still scratching the surface. Like, Mac Andrews just exploded. I think it would be a real blow if they lose Lacocious, just as an aside. Um, but, you know, some guys I haven't really seen a lot of yet. Um, Ethan Reed, Jed Walter, Will Graham coming in this year. I think the talent is not the issue there. I think they'll be okay. I know that's such a boring conservative answer, but I still think there's still a lot of growth from their best players that are going to be key. In particular, Flanders, Raul and Anderson are still not anywhere near the finished product of what they will become. Ben King still at the start of his prime, had a very good year. Mac Andrew has been an outstanding talent this year. I hope they keep Lacocious. I don't know if that's going to happen. Shadowlight says, Melbourne have uh, may have weaker picks come draft night, but this win certainly calms the waters in what's been a tough week. Though Viney's comments weren't all that reassuring of him sticking around. Damn, I wish I'd read that comment before I'd started this video because I don't know what Jack Viney said. That is, that is interesting. Um, I have made the point though, I think Melbourne's group of young players has set them up so that if they do need a list reset, which is probably at this point, right? It's probably time to be a little bit aggressive and maybe not, you know, just relentlessly hit the draft and turn over their list and trade all their players. But, you know, maybe I a few free agents and, you know, continue to take high picks. And I think they've drafted pretty well in recent times. And I think, you know, this could be a little reset for Melbourne on the agenda. And I don't think it's as dire as some other clubs. If Viney did leave, I do think it would leave them a bit exposed, though, to be honest. Unless Clayton stays and, you know, regains his best form, I don't think Petrarca's going to go anywhere. Collingwood versus Brisbane, the grand final rematch that um, certainly wasn't a dead rubber. At the time, Collingwood still had a decent chance of playing finals. They just needed West Coast to do them a favour, which, uh, you know, that didn't go so well. And Brisbane still playing for that top four chance and, you know, bottled this game. They led the whole game until the 29-minute mark, I think, of the final quarter. And Collingwood did what Collingwood do, and they step up in the final moments. And Lockie Shules bobs up. He's been a much maligned player this year. He was very, very good with a couple of late goals. Nick Dacos, one of his best performances. I don't know. That's a high bar. But I think it was, was it the second term. He had 13 possessions and two goals. I think that was the second term. It was. And I tell you what, like, people throw around things like Judd-like quite often and I don't know if I ever really saw, saw Dacos as a Judd like player but watch his goal where he burns off I think it's uh, Joyce and Lockie Neal who again I don't know how fast those guys are but it doesn't matter watch the explosive pace the change of direction the couple of bounces and steady the goal I wouldn't be surprised if that is goal of the year unbelievable effort so we'll go straight to the comments here because there's a few to unpack here Rogue Riot says Nick Dacos said no more pronouns for anyone else He's only allowed to be him. Also, if West Coast win, we're so back. If West Coast lose, it's Jova or Joeva. Um, yeah, you obviously posted that before West Coast did West Coast things and played Carlton. Um, I'd say sorry, but I don't care about Collingwood to the same extent. 
user says Lions need to play four quarter footy if they want to get through even one final round coming from a Lions supporter. Agreed. We'll keep moving. There's a few Brisbane ones. Mason Barker says it's a sick joke that Brisbane are simultaneously the most talented team team and also the most mentally fragile team in the comp. No amount of talent can overcome poor leadership and culture. There has to be questions about not just Fagan, but also Neil and a- Andrews and their ability to lead a team in a successful way. That is a harsh whack because I feel like Brisbane have been fairly resilient and you know strong-minded for the most part. I suppose you know their finals record up until 2023 was quite poor, um, but they did let, let this slip. Uh, I just think Hollingwood is just this kind of sleeping giant to some extent and that doesn't mean they're going to come back in a big way, but it just means that you, no game against them is very easy. So I don't know if I'm as harsh on Brisbane. I think what's ultimately going to cost them top four is a really poor start to the season rather than losing to the reigning premiers at the MCG in a tough game. S10 says Brisbane are pretenders and shouldn't be taken seriously by any Victorian side. Charles Atkinson says Brisbane probably won't make top four. And Felix says Brisbane won't win the premiership if they don't finish top four. So as for the Victorian side point, I don't think they need too many Victorian sides to take them seriously. If you look at the composition of the top six, so there's uh, the Bulldogs and Geelong um, and potentially Carlton and Hawthorne late, depending on how that plays out. But, you know, they don't really need to be necessarily winning games at the G against MCG tenants unless Carlton somehow get there or Hawthorne, of course. So I do think there's there's an opportunity here this year with the talent so even that a team can win outside the top four. And I think on quality, Brisbane's as good as anyone. So I'm not there writing them off yet. I understand why Brisbane fans are really frustrated. Um, And I don't know if I agree that they're mentally fragile. It's a bad loss. But again, had they started the season better, we wouldn't be having this same sort of conversation in my opinion. Maybe, Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. But I think they'll be okay, although I do think they have blown their top four chances. We'll move to the Giants-Fremantle game. The Giants prevailed by nine points in a very good game of footy that went down to the wire. 50-meter penalty against Bailey Banfield probably ruins Fremantle's chances, and it continues this trend of um, not only losing games recently, I think that's three in a row, and I've tipped them every time as well, which is frustrating for me. But I think there's also this trend of them not being able to win close games. Tough opponent, though. If we respect the Giants as a good opponent, I think Fremantle did well to be in the game for as long as they did, albeit it does have ramifications for their season. They were sitting, sitting in third spot with high... I'm quoting an article here. With high hopes of securing a double chance at the end of round 20, but could be out of finals contention by the time it hosts Port Adelaide. That's crazy. So my understanding of the situation is that Fremantle obviously need to beat Port Adelaide. That's the final... I think the final game of the season. So I'm kind of hoping that's a live game in terms of the top eight. They just need one of the three teams ahead of them to lose, and I think that's the Bulldogs, Hawthorne, and Carlton. I still think there's a decent chance of that. So I think Fremantle could still make the eight, but there's no doubt they've blown some opportunities. We'll get through the comments. Rick Pollard says, a heartbreaking day for Frio. I think you posted that before West Coast got slaughtered by Carlton too, so that would have not helped you. Amusement Production says, the Jesse Hogan rejuvenation has gone incredibly under the radar. And Gus Monfrey says, takeaway from the GWS Frio game is Jesse Hogan is a bloody star. He deserves a common medal by a mile. I wouldn't say that was the best win by the Giants as Frio took it right up to them, but they got the four points and should be eyeing for a top two finish at this rate. It's got to be a Sydney v Giants or Port in the grand final. Jesse Hogan has been unreal. And I do remember my friend, Caden McDonald, predicted Jesse Hogan for the common at the start of the year. I haven't forgot that because I thought it was such a... Um, not outlandish, but bold call because he did finish the year uh, well last year. And I think he has probably gone under the radar, probably by product of being a GWS player. But yeah, he's been fantastic and you know absolutely deserves a Coleman. And I think GWS previously had an issue with goal scoring in the front half, particularly from Tolls. That is now a strength with Jesse Hogan being as good as he is. Alexander Antichev says, Brent Daniels has an absolute hog on him. I'm not sure if that's a football-related one. G-Bags doubles down and says, Brent Daniels must be the best small forward in the comp right now. I think that's very fair. And I, um, I'm curious to see how well the rest of his season went. I'm going off memory here, but he's been certainly the form for small forward of the comp. He's been a good player for a while, but I think you know, pushing up the ground, he's getting a little bit more of the ball now and really elevated and probably broken out as an elite player. So be interesting to see how close he gets to All-Australian. I don't really remember how the first part of his season went. Mega Princess Penguin says, GWS needed a win like that. Not a come from behind late victory, a solid four-quarter performance. They're the real deal and should make the opposition wary come finals. I agree with you. And I had this lurking suspicion GWS would click at the right time this year, which is why I doubled down on my mid-season ladder prediction that GWS would 
play in a grand final. I actually don't remember if I said they'd beat Sydney in the grand final, but either way, I had them in the grand final. They tend to click at the right time. They are a proven finals quantity. Like they do win finals. When they get there, they I think if they win one, they usually win two or almost every time. So watch out. And I agree, this was different to the previous performances, a little bit more of a four quarter even performance. And I think that only bodes well. Let's talk about the showdown. I thought this presented as a bit of a banana skin game for Port Adelaide because the last three showdowns, they've entered the game as favorites, lost all three. At halftime, it looked that way. I think the Crows were up by nine points and I thought, surely not. They've done so well to get this season back on track and be a genuine top four contender, potentially a premiership contender. But they came home really strong and I think it was seven goals to two after halftime. I think Adelaide were goalless in the third term and Port Adelaide put in a mature performance that probably is a stride in the right direction to becoming the fully formed product. So a good performance. Zach Butters has been unreal this season. We have 42 disposals, 10 clearances, broke the record, I think, for disposals in a showdown. We already know he's an outstanding player. And Port Adelaide's clearance dominance was probably the single biggest factor in this game, amongst other things, of course. No stat is indicative in itself, but a good win for Port Adelaide. And they've got a tough trip to Fremantle next week. And I can't wait for that game, to be honest. I don't usually look forward to Fremantle games. Shadow Light says Port is really shining as a top two side at the moment. The Crows had an honorable fight but the power found the perfect spark to pull a sound victory. Well summed up. G-Bags, Port Adelaide have surely locked in a top four spot with Dan Houston's potential suspension could be a big loss. We've got a few comments on Houston. Samantha says, spicy showdown is spicy once again. Absolutely. Bit going on. Kane Corn's getting real pissed off at Joshua Shelley. <laughs> Danny Dark says, fingers crossed Port Adelaide lose finals in straight sets. I'm not sure if you're a Crows fan, um, but you know, maybe we could see a repeat of last year. Mando 07. Is Butter still a brown low chance? I'm delusional and put money on it. He is really good though. Yeah, interestingly, I actually looked this up and the brown low predictor on the afl.com.au website is not necessarily going to be that accurate, but it's better than anything I have. So I looked at it and he's not even on the first page of vote getters. He's on the second page. It doesn't mean he won't win it, um, but that kind of indicates he might not be a major contender. I think you have... Cripps, Dacos, and Neil, and I can't even remember the order. I think it might have been Cripps number one, then Dacos, then Neil. But I did see in an article recently that said Zach Butters is surely a lock for his All-Australian jumper this year, and I didn't, like, I think that's flown under the radar for me. It's, it's kind of hard to keep track of these things, you know, as the season wears on. So many good midfielders have ebbed and flowed, but I didn't think necessarily he was a lock for it. So, um, you know, he's definitely getting some recognition somewhere. Play on footy says, Houston bump took me back to the future, wowee. Dumb shit head ass says Danny Houston will be spending a life behind bars. And Fraser Clark said, Houston should get off if Maynard got off identical situations. I don't think it's an identical situation. Maynard jumped for a, um, like a smother, right? And then came down. Houston elected to bump. I don't, I don't know if I think it's the same sort of dog act that I think Jimmy Webster, you know, did in the preseason. Um, you know, it was a terrible decision Jimmy Webster made. Houston seemed a little bit more of a football act in the moment and and therefore I'm not necessarily thinking you know he he sniped him which has been a lot of the conversation out there so I'll say that however he did elect a bump he ended with a concussion he did leap the ground he's going to get some weeks and that's probably the right result here I just probably would stop short of thinking it was the dog act that some people are suggesting so what he gets at the tribunal will be very interesting because if he gets four weeks I think he can still play the grand final if Port Adelaide lose a qualifying final, play a semi. That that would be four games until the grand final. That's if they get there, of course. Um, on the other hand, if it's five weeks, he's ruled out. And if it's four weeks and Port Adelaide win their first final, he won't play. So interesting stuff. We'll move to St Kilda versus Geelong. This is a very interesting result. A really interesting game. Because, you know, I think going into this game, the Cats needed to win to seal top four because Brisbane lost. And at halftime, they're up by, I don't know how many points, but like four goals or something like that. And St Kilda steamed home, steamed home, like the family iron. And um, I read a quote here from Chris Scott. He says, they played some scintillating footy. It was kind of Harlem Globetrotters there at one stage which is unusual because the first half was so clearly on our terms. That's um, pretty high praise. And St Kilda were scintillating, to be honest. Like, they're playing with a brand at the moment in the second half of the year. Once they're pretty much out of finals contention, that is quite divergent from the St Kilda we're used to. They've been more like a dour defensive team. How many times have they scored over 100 points this second half of the year? It's happened quite a fair bit. There was also a game where they scored 39, I think, against Adelaide. Oh, and something like in the 30s or 40s against the Brisbane Lions. No doubt about that. So there's been a couple of bleak performances there, but around that, their form's been very good. 
And they scored 100 points in a loss to the Brisbane Lions at the Gabba as well. So I think something clicked at St Kilda. And while it hasn't happened every week and they've been really poor every odd week, I'm looking out for them next year. I think this could be the sign of things to come. Darcy Wilson was also awesome. We'll get to the comments. Aiden says, why Geelong so inconsistent? It's hard to know. I think um, I think part of this is St Kilda playing really well. Um, I think Geelong can look really good when they when they get on top in the midfield battle because their forwards are so efficient and and so uh, such a high quality. So that can explain some inconsistent performances. Maybe I think they just got out hunted by a team that was very slick. Pickle Green guy says Saints showing promising signs, potential final threat in years to come. They can score, and like some teams, they don't rely on the one player to do all the work. I agree. I agree. I think St Kilda has drafted really well over the last few years. I like the young talent and suggested some genuine upside there. They were a finals quality side last year. Shit the bed this year. Added a new layer, which is their goal scoring power and their speed and outside of class. That's been a clear trend in their recruiting. Darcy Wilson, probably the biggest example of that recently. Wanganine Miller not that long ago. Philip Poo, who, you know, when he hasn't been injured since he's come back to the side, he's been awesome. So Honestly, I don't know if I'm just getting lured into late season form, but they've been really good. Music Hats King says, Jet lag has proven to be an effect predominantly when traveling east. Hence, we were able to beat free over there, but upon returning, we were absolutely cooked for St. Kilda. This makes West Coast flags all the more impressive. Hey, I'll take the credit. I'll take the credit. Yep, I mean, suppose Geelong's first half was, you know, quite dominant in, in many respects, and they faded away, so maybe there's something to do with that, but... I'm not too sure if that is the reason they lost this game. And a lot of teams do travel east. And yeah, it'd be interesting to analyze the data on that. Like, how do teams go the week after returning from Perth? Gold Coast just did it. They went Gold Coast to Perth and then played Essendon at Marble and won in the dying stages. So, Gus Monfries, thank you to the Geelong Football Club for choking a 33-point lead to a bottom six side in St. Kilda. They've now cost themselves a top two spot and a final at the MCG unless some miracle happens. Of course, Geelong play West Coast at GMHBA. Oh, God, don't remind me. Out of all teams and venues in the last round. It's also great to see the AFL match fixing the Pies Lions game. At least there was no cheating in the other games. Okay, I'm not going to get too bogged into the cheating thing. I don't think it was match fixing. Um, but yeah, Geelong, they let this slip, but I think they are a team that can win away. Like, I think if they were playing the power at the MCG or Adelaide Oval in the first week of the finals, I don't really know if I'd expect too much of a deviation in their performance. I could be wrong. But I I don't think the um, away finals thing is going to hurt them too much. Although we did just discuss whether their trip back from Perth hurt, but they did win in Perth. Papley says, St Kilda are the best team in the comp when they can't play finals. They have been very good in the second half of the year, as I said. So it, it remains to be seen whether they take that into next year, but I'm seeing a different edge to St Kilda now. The Sunday games were all stinkers. They were all stinkers. So we'll start with the Western Bulldogs beating North Melbourne by 96 points. Biggest takeaway, Sam Darcy exploding with seven goals. He had 20 disposals as well, nine marks. And this was not long after he kicked one goal, five. That was actually last week. So the Bulldogs responded really well and put North to the sword. And North are a young, tiring team. We've got a couple of comments. He, he says, my round takeaway is that there has never been a supporter base that has gone through more than North Melbourne supporters. Just when we look to see some light in the tunnel, it all gets destroyed, starting to really doubt Clarkson. I'm not there yet. I think, as I said pre-season, I think you can expect these fluctuations from young sides. The North started the year a little bit lacklustre um, and, you know, then put on a really good stretch of form, got the three wins. And, you know, at halftime against West Coast, they looked like they had really made some strides. And then it's been a bad six quarters since. I think this is to be expected and I think you have to expect uh, the Bulldogs have some real firepower. So the recipe was going to be there. They did play much better the first time they met. I think that was only three goals. I think North Melbourne are a young side that it should not be expected to be able to play out a whole season. And the season's getting longer. It's now 25 games or 25 weeks of action, including opening round, um, which is only 23 games still, but it's a long season for a young team. I don't think that really deviates my perception of North Melbourne. I think they've been overexposed. I expect them to be a better team next year. Kanga says, rebuilds don't need to take over five years to, and work with what you've got because clearing the shit, the listing 10 to 15 players a year is only going to put you backwards. Agreed. Agreed. And um, I don't want to double down on North Melbourne right now, but I have been saying that. And I did, you know, back in like, they did this in 2019, they cut like 12, 13 players or something like that. And uh, I think that's excessive. And I think, um, you know, as a club that is also down the bottom of the ladder, I think I expect us to be a little more conservative with that, but I could be wrong. 
uh, I, I think the biggest response to this is I've just done a video on Hawthorne and how they've rebuilt and you know the way that they rebuilt has not relied at all on high draft picks so it's an interesting watch if um, if you can be bothered Hawthorne versus Richmond, speak of the devil. This was an interesting game. I did flick over yeah, um, once the Eagles game started naturally, but I watched a bit of Hawthorne v. Richmond. And Hawthorne, you know, were too good as you'd expect. Uh, other than a four-goal burst from Richmond in the second quarter, which was quite uh, impressive, but naturally being the depleted side that Richmond are and a young side, and dare I say it, a little talent deficient at the moment, uh, they couldn't sustain that. The other takeaway is that Will Day hurt himself. So uh, he got a collarbone that has been confirmed not to be a break which is a good result. And John Newcomb, you know, really stepped up in this game. 14 score involvements, 15 contested possessions, nine clearances. You already knew he's a good player. Um, but yeah, good performance. So we'll get through the comments. Jaden9465 says, even though the Hawks smash Richmond, the Tigers have shown the comp how to stop the Hawks train in the second quarter. I haven't been able to determine like what it is exactly about that second term that Richmond were able to do to stop Hawthorne. Did Hawthorne just stop for a little bit? Um, you know, I don't know. Hawthorne really powered through in the second half, but Richmond, young side. Um, I'd be interested to see if anyone had any specific thoughts on that because I kind of was half watching because the Eagles were playing soon. Sandon Perkins said, Hawthorne are possibly the side that is least relying on superstars in the comp. Will Day was originally seen as the main reason for Hawthorne's turnaround. Now they've had two 60-point wins and a close loss to the form team in the comp away from home in the last three weeks without any influence from Day at all. Still hoping he comes back for the first week of the finals regardless. I agree they're not really reliant on superstars and that probably gets overblown. Um, his, their form kind of may or may not coincide with Will Day. Like he's a good player and their best and fairest from last year. So he is important. Um... I'm not really too sure as to how they will go without him. We saw John Newcomb really stand up in this game. Not the strongest opposition, and you imagine a finals game will be different. So, again, I'm just hoping he's fit because he is a great player to watch. Um, again, confirmed not to be a break. I'm not sure exactly where that sits. Cooper says Hawthorne will fall down without Will Day and be eliminated in the first round of finals. We'll see. Uh, again, I sort of probably wish I'd read that before I'd answered the, the last one. We'll see. I mean, it's going to be a tough ask to play finals. It's been a long run of form from Hawthorne here, pre-finals by. I have no idea what to expect from them. I'm hoping they play well because it's very entertaining. And S10 says September Hawk is coming. Well, that's true. They, um, you know, they just need to beat North Melbourne, right, to play finals. So they should be there. And saving the best for last, West Coast versus Carlton. Oh, my God, what a stinker this game was. It's hard to remove myself from the emotion of it being a passionate West Coast fan who didn't tip West Coast but kind of thought we would win and we didn't even get close. And uh, Carlton, severely depleted, put on a bit of a clinic and um, they deserve a lot of credit for that. So I've already whinged and ranted about West Coast in my True Eagle video, if anyone cares to see that. It was disgraceful. <laughs> um, it was disgraceful is such an ugly word, but I would say that it was a shameful game. I would use that word. They should be embarrassed. They should get all the criticism that they will get this week. And uh, in my opinion, one of the worst losses of the season to be that easy to roll over against a team that was severely depleted. Now, the game was probably won in the midfield where Carlton was still strong and Patrick Cripps was unreal. So he had 21 disposals in the first half, 13 concepts of possessions, four clearances. And like I said earlier in this video, Possibly going to win the Brownlow medal. Uh, the AFL website's predictor has him there. West Coast had no response. And the conditions weren't easy. Don't get me wrong. Um, and I think West Coast's skill level was still really bad. Like, sure, it was blustery and windy and a little bit slippery. But we're talking about five-meter handballs here. So Carlton keep their season alive. I'm glad in a sense. I mean, I obviously wish it hadn't gone like that. And, and I'd rather West Coast have won. But it keeps the finals race interesting and um, they deserve a lot of credit in, in there's a very small part of me that's happy for them to have bucked the trend there. But wow, as a West Coast fan, one game to go in the season, GMHBA, like this is where we need a mercy rule. Just end the season, seriously. Elaine Zong says, West Coast is shit, but we might be tanking in order to get Frio and Pies out. <laughs> so like I said, um, Collingwood probably can't make it, but Fremantle can if Fremantle beat Port Adelaide and one of Hawthorne, if they lose to North, unlikely that one. Carlton St Kilda could open the door for Fremantle because St Kilda are good at the moment. And also just checking my phone here, the Bulldogs versus the Giants. If Fremantle beat Port and the Giants beat the Bulldogs, that is still very possible. So we may get the worst of both worlds. But anyway, guys, that will wrap up the football come down. Thank you so much for your submissions. I'll be back soon later today for just the tips. Thanks. I'll see you in the next one.